beer geek. Probably not that popular in this audience, I am guessing. However, if you're one of the few that is into beer, uh, I want to chat about that. I will talk beer off all day and night. I actually studied beer uh, and brewing professionally uh, in college for two years and worked at a brewery for some time. Um, a bit of a side hobby slash passion of mine, so happy to chat on that. Who are you guys? Uh, I'm guessing mostly front-end developers at this conference. JS? No. Nobody does JavaScript? <laughs> I do back end JavaScript. Back end? Full stack? Back end, fix the front end when we need to be fixed. Gotcha. Okay, so you back up the guys that are messing up the front end and then fix the back end at the same time. Um, okay, who's played with WebRTC? And what did you do with it? Uh, I'm actually trying to do a two-way communication. Okay. So two way like video calling video. back and forth? Yeah. Canvas drawing. How did it work out for you? Um, video would be easy. Yeah. yeah. So you got it to set up, I mean you got the whole signaling process and the turn server and the stun server. Yeah. That's usually the tricky part for people is getting the uh, server side portion of it. Um, WebRTC is a front end technology but it's a server side component for actually connecting two people together. Uh, we'll talk more about that in detail in a minute. Um, Anybody else work with WebRTC at all? Read anything about it? Know anything about what I'm talking about? Read things about it. All right, what do you read? Uh, we're trying to set up a browser-based software. Okay. So we do all, a lot of telephony, but you have to set up your stations and all that kind of crap. So we want to just be able to um, serve up the station configuration and have them who got to free switch. Okay. Uh, yeah, we should try a little bit after, too. Actually, um, the parent company for the company I'm working with is called Digium. Uh, they make an open source phone system called Asterisk, and they're on about 15 years. So if there's any old telephony geeks in the audience, you've probably heard of those guys. Uh, we're kind of a natural extension of that, that communication space to bring it to the web. But, okay, so good audience here. You guys sound like you at least have an inkling of what's going on with this stuff, which makes my job a little bit easier. So what the heck is WebRTC? Uh, for the uninformed, here's the definition as presented by Mozilla Foundation. Uh, WebRTC is a free, open project that enables web browsers with real-time communications, that's the RTC piece, capabilities via simple JavaScript APIs. Okay, uh, it's kind of a mouthful, tells us a little bit of information, let's pick it apart a bit. So free, uh, it's free to use. It is under the ESD license, which means you're free to use, adjust, edit, add to as you see fit. Uh, you can also contribute back to the project. Uh, that's the open piece. But it's open source, you have access to the full source code uh, that actually makes this stuff work. So if you see a bug, contribute. Uh, if you have ideas for new features, one thing I would love to see myself is easier access to the file APIs uh, built into WebRTC. So currently if you want to do like a transmission of a file, you have to get access to it, turn it into byte data, stream it across, put it back together, all this stuff. It'd be really cool if somebody added a method to just do that simply. Um, there's a bunch of people like myself and our company that are putting out some stuff to help with that, um, but why not put it on the open source piece? So contributions are welcome uh, as an open source project. Real-time communications, this is sort of the meat and potatoes of WebRTC. Uh, this means video and audio calling in the browser, natively with no plugins. Uh, it also means being able to transfer things like data over direct connections. Um, sort of the underlying piece of this is this peer-to-peer -peer communications. That's, that's the big. Um, so being able to connect browser A to browser B across a peer-to-peer -peer channel, you think of something similar to a WebSocket, only you pull the server component out, and it goes directly browser to browser, that's what you're working with with peer-to-peer -peer in WebRTC. Um, so once you have that channel open, it's a matter of you know streaming video data, streaming audio data, very low latency, uh, very high quality, and no bandwidth uh, costs. So when you're not streaming something up through a server and down to a client, you're not paying for every bit that goes across that server. So the peer-to-peer -peer piece can actually save you quite a bit of money as well. Um, so real-time, it's all happening in real-time, right? It's, it's live, like we're talking now in real-time, the same thing in the browser. Um, and JavaScript APIs, it's all JS. Um, yes. Just a question about the browser to browser. Now, browsers aren't always situated in a, they're not always in a position to directly communicate with each other. In what sense? Well, let's say uh, you have a firewall. How are you going to talk to uh, something on the one network or yep. something on another network if it so we yeah, we'll get, certain ports are all. We'll get, that, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, okay. There's actually a whole section of this talk that's covering that piece. And that's sort of the, the really cool, nerdy, techy stuff that happens to make all this work. It's the magic, if you will. Um, and yeah, we've got a whole section coming up here in a second. Uh, so JavaScript APIs, this stuff's all in JS. So you guys all pretty much all know JavaScript, right, I'm assuming. Um, 
this stuff that you can work with today without having to learn a new language, you know, learn a new framework, um, you can just start playing with it. It's native to the browser. It's just built on top of the HTML5 spec. So it's going to be native as any browser that supports WebRTC will support these APIs. So contributors, uh, I mentioned Mozilla a bit earlier and their, uh, their definition there, but Google, Mozilla, and Opera are the three big ones contributing to this spec. Um, it's a proposal right now being formed into a spec. Uh, and IE is kind of coming out with their own version of this. They're calling it ORTC or Object RTC, which, shocking, IE has to do something weird and different. Um, that being said, for the first time, I'm actually seeing contributions coming from IE uh, be very useful. Um, I can't remember the exact example, but they contributed some stuff back into the, the open source version that the rest of the guys are working on, and it was actually accepted in. Um, so some of the stuff they're looking at and tooling around and changing is actually being seen in a positive light. So the hope is, is that, you know, give it a year or so, these guys are all going to come and put a finalized spec and, you know, agree upon this stuff and then just implement it in their browsers. Um, you know, a lot of fingers crossed that we're not going to have the standard old browser wars where you have to do prefixes for everything, i.e. something completely different, so you have to write a whole other set of scripts for that. Um, you know, the rumor mill at least says that these guys are going to come up in agreement on the standard and basically works, create something that works across the browsers. Uh, but right now there are things like uh, prefixes that you have to work with. So WebRTC in the wild. Uh, what does this stuff do? What is it capable of? What are people doing with it today? Uh, Amazon Mating. You guys ever see this in the commercial? It was like maybe two Christmases ago. Amazon's Kindle Fire XD, whatever they're calling it, came out. And they had this cool little feature where you could press the Mayday button and you would be talking with a very friendly, happy, bubbly, pretty support representative. Um, not who you get on the phone if you actually go out and try this. Uh, it's not as shiny or happy. Um, guy I talked to was you know, friendly enough, but uh, it seemed a little bit overworked. So this is sort of the marketing ploy of the whole tool. That being said, the technology is pretty darn cool. Um, the video portion of this, this is what I've researched. Don't hold me to this. Uh, if Amazon's watching, I'm not 100% sure. But based on what I found, uh, they actually handled the video portion of this over WebRTC channels. So the actual support rep you would be talking to would be on a browser with a webcam talking to you video-wise, the audio portion was then routed through their traditional call center over the uh, phone network. Um, so since they already had that whole infrastructure in place, they would actually have the call initiate that way, and once it was connected, they would open up the video channel to get the full, the full cycle. Now, question, uh, what does Google, uh, Google Chat use? The WebRTC, so Hangouts? Okay. Yeah, okay. it used to be plug-in based because the technology didn't exist. Uh, about eight months ago now, I want to say, uh, they switched out the plug-in model to their own WebRTC, so they're eating their own dog food as it were. Um, you may have noticed too, versus the plugin, it works a heck of a lot better. Um, it's faster, it's smoother, there's less bugs. There's still bugs, but there's less bugs. Um, same thing with Firefox too, they just came out with their, was it Hello something chat? Uh, it was the Firefox's browser-based video chat that they built out. Um, I think they might have just called it Hello even. Uh, but they are using WebRTC as well in their, in their product. Um, so yeah, the Amazon made it. The other thing they did here that was kind of neat beyond the audio and video calling in your device is that you see how they've got some things circled there. They're actually sending data across that same peer channel that we talked about um, to show different areas of the screen. So the uh, the user, or excuse me, the uh, customer support rep could actually circle things on the screen to say, click here, pay attention to this slider, look at this here, uh, to interact with the user in a more rich way. So Google Hangouts. Um, like we mentioned, most of you guys have probably seen these or used these at some point or another. Uh, classic video chat with uh, audio going in as well as messaging um, and then silly stuff like this where you can add party ads on your friends and then take screen caps so you can use it in front of audiences like this, which is always fun too. Um, but this pretty much showcases the full spec of the, uh, the WebRTC APIs. It's got screen sharing, it's got video, it's got audio. Uh, the messaging stuff's built out separately, but it's a good use case for everything you can do today. Um, so as you're thinking about applications that might have uh, uses for this technology, kind of think back to Google Hangouts and think of, okay, well, they had video calling enabled. That's something I could do with WebRTC. I could put that into my app uh, today or my mobile app, web app, whatever you want to call it. Peer CDN, now this was a much more interesting use of the tech. Uh, so we've talked about that kind of peer-to-peer -peer connection and how you've got a pipe to play with. So what Peer CDN did uh, was to create a JavaScript library that you would drop into your website, just do as an include, script source included. Um, it would then scrub your site for static assets. So things like images, PDFs, videos, anything that was uh, large bandwidth consumption type files, so static stuff. It would then basically create a content distribution network of the users on your site. So if we all went to this website and I was the first guy there, and I downloaded all the images or I had PDFs that were available, when you came to the site, it would first look and say, is anyone else on the site right now logged in that has these files that I can stream them from? Think sort of like a BitTorrent model. 
uh, rather than pulling them off of a traditional CDN where you pay bandwidth. And if I have the files and you see that, I'll start streaming the bits from my machine over to you through a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So you can see the graph here. They're talking about how much money they save. And if it's something like 92.1 terabytes were streamed over that peer-to-peer -peer connection, with another 61 terabytes being the traditional download model, and they saved something like $8,000 in that time span, whatever that was. Now, why, why does it save money? I, you know, you still have to go, even if it's peer-to-peer, you still have to go through your outgoing link uh, to, to the internet. Yeah, correct. And, and so, 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 and you, where, where does the cost saving come from then? You're not downloading it from your server. So if you're the one to pay It's not a savings to, to you. It's a savings to them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, you're utilizing my computer, your computer to bypass the server. But you're not paying by the byte for data transfers on your internet connection. You're paying a flat monthly yeah. fee. If you're hosting a large, let's say you've got a 10 gig video file that you're hosting on your web host server, or your web server, and people come and download that, you're paying for every bit that gets downloaded because web hosts traditionally charge. Okay, okay. okay. so there's a saving, saving for, for, for the server, or not? Correct. Okay. So if you're the one hosting the site, you're the one saving the money. Okay. But you're also the person making the site, so you implement these things. Does that all make sense? Yeah. So that was kind of an example of being clever and being able to stream the data, or the file data, across a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, these guys actually got bought by Yahoo, so now they're part of that whole uh, product line. ShareFest, um, not a very interesting website to look at, so I have the kind of required cat picture for my slides. Uh, ShareFest did something with file sharing as well, only instead of creating a distribution network, they actually created a single peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing. So what you do is go to the website, click on a JavaScript file browser, you find the file you want to share, and what you get is a URL that's something like sharefest.me slash 123456, whatever the, the GUID is. Uh, you then send that URL to somebody else, and when they go to the URL, it actually creates that peer-to-peer -peer connection between you and streams the file over to them. Uh, they have to accept and all these things. There's a few security measures in place, but basically, it's creating a link between you and the person you want to share the file with. Now, the good thing about this is there's not bandwidth uh, limitations. So things like uh, Dropbox or other sites where you might be limited on the size of the files you can share or have to pay for the size of the files you share, uh, this is going directly peer-to-peer -peer in uh, the browser. CubeSlam. Um, I wonder if we have time to show this thing to you real quick. This is kind of a cool thing. Google put this together. Um, it's an example of using WebRTC in gaming. Uh, this is also a good showcase of WebGL, or the uh, kind of 3D you know, stuff that you're doing in, uh, in JavaScript for uh, web graphics. So what this is, is, uh, I'll just play a bear real quick. If you were to play a friend, the little bear in the background would actually be the video of your friend, right? So it's, it's showcasing video and audio. You can actually talk back and forth. Uh, this is sort of the simulated version. So let's see what we got here. And it's just a little pong game. Uh, what's interesting, though, is all the data, you know, the position of the controllers, um, the position of the puck and the score, all that stuff is being sent across that same peer-to-peer -peer channel, I believe just as JSON data. So it's actually handled in real-time 3D graphics in the browser, which has nothing to do with WebRTC, but it's using that same data API to transmit over a very low latency connection the game data. So if you think about any games online and kind of the latency you experience between server and user, um, this can help to resolve that. And again, you're not having to spin up a game server in order to run this. Uh, you're just running it from you know peer to peer in the browser. So when you think of instances where normally you go spin up a, a instance of Unity or some other gaming server and have to pay to host that, pay for the bandwidth, all that stuff, this is sort of replacing that traditional model for you. So again, just another thing to think about as you're uh, looking at playing with this kind of stuff. I'm sorry, Paul, you, could you explain that it, it's used to reduce the latency? So if you think about a round trip, right? Uh, normally, if you're sending data for a game traditionally, you're going to go from the client, say me, if we're connected, we're playing a game. I'm going to send it from my browser up to a server. The server is going to do something with it and send it back down to you, the other user, right? With peer-to-peer, -peer, we take that whole server piece out of the middle. So instead of making a hop and another hop, it's just going directly. Um, so in the same way, WebSockets are a heck of a lot faster way to communicate you know, than some traditional methods. Uh, this works in a similar way, except it doesn't use the server anymore. It's a shortcut, essentially. Um, so Apollo is actually a product we developed in-house that I mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, for communications. It's a rich communications client similar to Slack or any Google Hangouts or any of the others that are out there today. Um, but we were able to actually custom tailor it to what we needed. So I can copy to the clipboard, paste into that uh, little text input there. We got messaging, group messaging, calling to phones, uh, phone into this system here. You can do a conference call over the phone. 
You can do screen sharing, video calling, audio calling, on and on and on. Um, and we built this as sort of a showcase piece, but we also built it because we needed a better tool internally for our communications. Uh, we're a distributed team, so having guys all over the country, it's really hard to stay in touch sometimes, and Hangouts wasn't doing everything we wanted or needed. Um, so if we need new features in this, if there's something cool that we want to add into it, uh, maybe it's a whiteboarding feature or something like that, we can go ahead and build it in. Um, and it's just a product that we built. But it kind of shows you how you can take these features that are available and start dropping them into applications that you're creating. In this case, creating an application around it. So how does it work? WebRTC, all this peer-to-peer -peer business that we're talking about. It's kind of like this. You guys remember the old cans and strings? Um, you've got a browser on one side, or a can. You've got a browser on the other side, another can. In between, you've got this pipe, which is basically your string. So we're creating that channel, and across that's where we're streaming all the data. Everything else around it is the APIs and the methods that allow you to interact with things like your webcam, your microphone, um, and to actually be able to connect those two things together. So you asked earlier about kind of how these things connect and how that works with things like a firewall. Um, to showcase that, we'll talk about Bob and Alice. So Bob and Alice doing the online dating thing. They met on cavemandate.com. They wanted to use paleodate.com, but that was actually taken by a paleo lifestyle, the guys that eat that way, paleo diets. It was a dating site for people that eat paleo. So we went with caveman date. Um, but Bob and Alice, they were doing a smart thing and they decided to have a video call before they meet up in person for the first time. Luckily for them, Caveman Day implemented some sort of a video call feature as part of their website. So in an ideal world, it would work something like this. They both go on their browsers through a process known as signaling that actually shares some information back and forth. And that information would be you know, whether or not they have access to a webcam or a microphone, uh, some information about their local uh, IP and port, how they connect up. Um, they share that back and forth and then ideally, they disconnect and create this peer-to-peer -peer connection. However, in the real world, it's a little bit different. It looks more like this. In the real world, we have things called NAT, network address translators, like you mentioned, firewalls, routers, uh, painful little things that make our lives easier and allow us to have these big distributed networks with a single IP address in front of them, but hard when you want to connect things up to the, uh, the outside world. Right? So in the real world, it kind of stops short. But that's where this thing called ICE comes in, and this is a technique used by the WebRTC spec to actually figure out how to traverse around those routers or those firewalls and actually connect people up regardless of their network topology. So this is not the most complicated graphic in the world, but not the most simple. But what's happening here is, let's say Bob's at a coffee shop. He's out in public or he's on the campus network, whatever it might be. It's open. It's wide open. So Bob's going to ping out to a thing called a stun server. And this is part of that ice packet um, thing that I was talking about, the technique. So the technique basically says, Bob, your browser is going to ping out to this stun server and say, hey, stun server, what do I look like to Alice or to the rest of the world for that matter? The stun server's only job is to say, hey, Bob, you're public, here's your IP address, here's your port. This is all you need to send on to all the people to connect to you, right? You're wide open. So Bob says, great. He then passes that packet along to Alice, who now has access to Bob, okay? Alice is at the office. Online dating at work makes perfect sense. They have a big fat firewall in place. She pings out to the stun server. The stun server says, Alice, I can't see you. You're behind a firewall. Um, Bob's not going to be able to access you directly. So you're going to need to reroute to this thing called a turn server. And the stun server doesn't actually tell her that. That's actually programmed as part of the, uh, the signaling process in your application. Uh, but basically, if the stun server fails and says, hey, I can't access you, you're going to use this thing called a turn server, also known as a relay server, to relay around that firewall. So Alice is going to share that turn server's information with Bob instead of her own local information. And when Bob tries to communicate with Alice, it's going to go more the traditional route, where it actually goes up through that turn server and back down to Alice. In that method, it actually traverses around the firewall and allows them to still connect. You will still get some uh, bandwidth charges in that case. So that's more the traditional up and down that method that we talked about, where you're using a server in between. But that's sort of the fail safe that they put in place to allow everyone to connect. So, so how much, I would imagine for the PRCDN, um, hey, you would have a problem that, you know, like, 90% of the users find themselves needing to use the uh, turn server. So that, the case now, the statistics as they stand, uh, it's currently something like 14% of people that need to use that turn server. Really? Yeah. Um, so if you think about that instance in the pure CDN case, you're expecting to see roughly 86% savings in bandwidth costs. Uh, so, so I mean, don't most people have some kind of a router before they connect to it? Uh, like, uh, like a local uh, Yep, plan. internally. And that's not necessarily going to stop this. And so how do you get around to that? How does the, uh, your local router know 
does it need to be, I imagine it needs to be some, uh, you need to have another special configuration so that uh, an outside connection can come in to a, a, a host on, uh, on, on the LAN. Yeah, you might think that that's generally not the case. Unless you have some sort of a specific firewall set up to prevent people uh, specifically from actually getting your access to your public IP address, or excuse me, your, your private IP address inside the public network, and that port information, it generally works. So oh, you know, UDP. If they use UDP, then that does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what they're using under the uh, And then that, that works and everything. Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay. Who provides the turn server and the stun server? That's a fine question, my friend. Um, so it's actually kind of a pain to set up, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's something you have to host. So in order to play with this stuff, and part of the reason that I'm out talking about you know, what we're doing at Respo, part of the value add there is that we host that for you. Um, there are some free ones out there. If you guys want to play around with the native stuff and, and figure out, configure all this stuff, um, Google has some stun and turn servers available, but they're only for uh, testing, right? They're not for production code. So you're going to need to figure out some sort of solution to either spin up your own or pay for somebody to host it for you um, in order to use this stuff in production. So having a service like Perspoke, uh, not to sound preachy, but you know, kind of takes that piece out for you. Um, and also, this whole signaling process that we're showing here, there's quite a bit of uh, information you have to learn up on in order to get this working. There's this whole offer answer process, and you're actually coding that in JavaScript to say, hey, I pinged the stun server, uh, now I got this information back, I'm gonna send an offer over to Alice, and she's gonna return an answer to me, and then I have to accept it, exchange it. That's all stuff that you as a developer have to code, um, unless you're using a, a third-party service that kind of takes care of that piece for you. Does anyone offer like virtual clients or something for these? Yeah, there's uh, seems there's like a couple be a companies. basic config that yep. work for most people. So there's some open source uh, configurations available. I don't have the names of any offhand, but if you Google uh, open source turn server, open source stun server, you can certainly find that stuff. Um, and I don't know how hard they are to set up. I haven't actually set up one of the you know the open source ones yet. I've tried to configure the uh, you know, the actual native stuff on my own, and it's, it's a bit tricky. Um, and that's kind of when I turn to learning up on third party. Um, but yeah, they're definitely out there, man. You can find them. So if that's, if that's your gig and you want to kind of build up your own thing, um, by all means, just uh, a little Google, you should be able to find something to help you get started. So the complete connection now should look something like this. Uh, ideally, Bob and Alice are both going to be open. They're going to connect directly away. If it's one of those small 14% chance kind of scenarios where she's behind a firewall or he's behind a firewall, they're going to uh, use that turn server basically to get around it and act as that, that backup. That all makes sense to everybody? So is the turn server, like, does that run over HTTP ports, or is that still going to require that special ports are open on the It's on HTTPS. The okay, yeah. so it does run over HTTPS. Yeah. So, yeah, that should uh, I mean, give you a secure connection. Traditionally, or uh, by default, WebRTC needs to run on, on HTTPS um, in order to be secure. Um, and as far as the trickle-down stuff, I think it goes HTTPS, UDP, S, and then down from there. Um, there's kind of a a degradation or a trickle down as far as, uh, as how the connections actually work, um, which, which uh, method it uses. Simple, right? Everybody ready to run out and build that today? We can get it up in an hour or so. Um, so yeah, sales pitch. Uh, this is kind of where our scope comes in. And there's, like I said, a few other companies that do stuff similar to what we're doing, uh, just to be fair. But we basically provide a set of APIs that give developers the ability to easily add these things into their applications. Um, so when you start looking at the native APIs, there's a lot of stuff to learn up on. Um, and what our framework aims to do is to make it easier for developers to start playing with this stuff today. If you want to build a video call, we're going to do one here in the next 15 minutes, um, as opposed to having to go out and spin all that stuff up on your own. Uh, so kind of like WebRTC, except we wrap the turn and the stun server for you. So that's all stuff that we host internally for you. Um, all you have to do is call client.connect, and you connect into the Respoke framework. Um, and from there, we handle all the handshaking and everything for you. Uh, you just have to know the ID of the person you want to talk to, basically. So, so remember these guys, uh, Bob and Alice? With Respoke, it looks something more like this. You know, you connect out to the cloud, tell Respoke, hey, I'm connecting into this application, providing an application ID, and then you say who you want to connect to. So Bob would say, I want to get the endpoint for Alice. We're going to return that object to you, and then you can call uh, endpoint.send message, endpoint.start video call. Um, much simplified methods compared to sort of the native stuff. All right, so let's get down to the good stuff, code. Uh, so if you want to play around with Respoke, hit Respoke.io and ask for an email address to get a free developer account and you can start playing with this stuff. Uh, the examples we're going to walk through here kind of use that because it's a heck of a lot faster and well, for obvious reasons. Um, so the first thing you need to do is get connected. Uh, this isn't the most exciting example in the world, but it kind of shows you guys the, the simple part of that whole signaling process. So here I'm just going to type in Kyle. 
you guys see this okay? Mm -hmm. Blow it up a little bit. So you can see connected or spoke is gone, right? So let's look at the code for that. Big enough? Bigger? More bigger? That's good. All right. So I'm connecting in, or uh, rather I'm including the Respoke uh, library here, all from our CDN. So it's all you got to include to play with the library. It's just a single JS file. And it's worth mentioning the JS stuff uh, is open source. So it's out on GitHub, uh, as are our mobile SDKs, and those get released in a week or two. Um, so if you guys want to contribute to this stuff, play around with it, uh, commit bug fixes, whatever you need to do to make it work for your business, um, you can certainly get that on GitHub and start playing around with it. Um, we've got some simple UI stuff here, so a div, an input, a button, standard stuff. Here's that application ID I mentioned. Uh, when you create a new application in the Respoke framework, we give you an ID. Uh, that basically creates a container for your application. So if we had a container around this room, everybody in here would be able to find each other because we're under that same app ID. If we created a second app ID and had an app for the group in the other room, they wouldn't know anything about anyone in here. So you think about that as sort of the boundary line uh, with that application ID. So I mentioned creating that client. Uh, what you do to create the client object, which is sort of your top level actor in the Respoke framework, is to call client. You pass in that application ID. And when you're doing development, you can pass in this development mode equals true. Um, all it's doing is to basically say, hey, I'm, I'm not in production right now. I'm not too worried about security. I want to play around with this stuff. Just leave it wide open. We take care of tokens, and we give you full permissions. Uh, when you go to production and you want to lock it down, you can actually set up your own token authentication and choose the levels of permissions that you want various users to be able to have within the applications. So if you want users to be able to create groups, uh, if they're an admin, or if they're a traditional user, not be able to create groups, things like that, you can lock all that stuff down in your, uh, your application settings. Um, so here we're going to listen for the connect event. That's going to be the event that tells us that we've connected or spoke, and we can uh, proceed doing whatever we need to do in our application. And then the connection part itself um, just looks like this, client.connect. And passing through this endpoint ID, which in this case was my name, um, how you identify people in your application is really up to you. If you had a database full of users all stored by a GUID, you could use that GUID. Uh, if you had them stored by their email address, you could use that email address. It's really up to you as the developer to determine how you best want to uh, represent your users within the application. So that's the basics of connecting. Uh, pretty simple stuff there. Look at something a little bit more interesting. Uh, messaging. So if anybody's following along here, if you could click on this URL for me. And I just need uh, one person's name to connect in here. Sasha. Sasha. S A S H A? Yeah. Got it. And you're connected up? Oh, you, no. Yeah, I need somebody that's actually connected. <laughs> Paul. Paul. Lowercase? All right, let me know when you're connected there, Paul. Oops. I, I went to that original URL and I'm on a page that hasn't changed at all. But I don't. It's the slides. Yeah, I'm on the slides. But my one's not working. Oh, it's not updated? No. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was case my name, too. I wonder if the internets are uh, not playing along. Um, I'm connected. Are you connected as uh, a user? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so all we're doing here is sending a simple message. This is pretty, it's pretty basic stuff. It just tests. Zero, 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 Y. Y, okay. Capital T. It does. It does in this instance because I built these applications. I will say this, they're stupid simple uh, for a reason. They're meant to showcase the functionality and really not get into depth of checking things like code and, uh, and verifying name cases and stuff like that. Um, so I'm gonna send, yeah, there it is. You guys got it. Yeah. So you can all message to me. It's sort of a one to many uh, in reverse. So I'm one out to whatever user I wanna talk to, but everybody else can connect into me. So what's happening here is that when I wanna message Troy, I'm actually gonna create a connection with him and then send that message across. Um, in Respoke, it looks like this. We want to get access to that endpoint. That's kind of how we refer to people. Uh, you'll hear it a lot in WebRTC as peer or endpoint uh, as the person you want to talk to. That's basically just a user on a browser. So the endpoint, you call client.getEndpoint, you pass through the ID, and then the value of their ID. So in this case, I was just passing through the string Troy. That's going to turn me an instance of the endpoint object, which I can then start calling methods on. Um, so here I'm calling endpoint.sendMessage, passing through again just plain old JavaScript objects here with a message value of you know, whatever I typed in is the message text. What's interesting with those, uh, those objects is they are just JS objects, right? So if you want to pass through event information or any number of other things, data through there, like file data or something like that, you can package it up however you wanted and then just have to identify it on the other side. So if I had written my application to check, say, a type property of that object and say if it's type data, to know that it's going to be some bits that I want to configure into a file object, I could do that. 
Um, it's just a dummy or a dumb JavaScript object. So whatever you want to put in there, uh, you can really use this API to full advantage. All right, so something a little bit more interesting, uh, group messaging. Are you guys able to, uh, is it updating now or is it still kind of lagging away there? I'm just following along the slides. So. Okay, sweet. Um, so are you guys, is anybody able to pull up the group messaging channel? Yeah. All right, so this should just be messaging the same way but out to a group. So it's just gonna connect you to this group foo. Uh, so as soon as we see we're connected, everybody's going to join this one group called Foo, and I'm just doing that automatically. Um, so anything you send out is going to go out to the whole group. Uh, and if anybody's uh, good with script hacking, uh, I didn't strip anything out on this, so I'll just say that very quickly. <laughs> so if you're clever and quick, you might have some fun with this. Leave that up while we're looking at the code. Um, so the code for that is pretty similar to our, our previous message, except uh, we've got the group portion. So. We're going to listen to that connect event like we did before. And then we're going to call client.join, passing in the ID uh, of the group we want to join. So in this case, it was foo. And again, this is just a JavaScript object. And then we've got two event handlers for onSuccess and onMessage. OnSuccess is going to be fired off uh, when we actually successfully connect into that group. So that's when we know we can start sending messages out. So you can update your UI or do whatever you might need to do there. And the onMessage piece is going to be when you actually receive a message from the group. So when somebody sends a message out, you can see here all I'm doing is adding an LI or pending rather, uh, via jQuery to a, uh, an unordered list. So we're just adding those messages into the group. And the send message function, um, instead of calling endpoint.send message, we're going to call group.send message. And the group was uh, actually gathered up here. Here it is, this.group equals group. So the unsuccess function also turns you reference to the group that you're actually making part of. All right, so this stuff is fun, useful, not the most exciting. Video calling, however, is a little bit more fun. Um, so if somebody can help me out with this one too, I'm going to connect in this code. And then I just need a name again. Maybe Troy will help me out. Sure. All right. Capital T again. Capital T. <laughs> you gotta be tricky, Troy. Are right, you connected? Yep. All right, so I'm going to try to call Troy here. And what's going to happen is you're actually going to see a little pop-up that says allow or deny. And this is basically the security measure that's in place since I'm not serving this over HTTPS. It's going to tell the user, hey, they're trying to access your microphone via JavaScript. I don't know if anybody remembers from Flash days, but they had a similar method there where it always asked you, do you want to allow access to your microphone and camera? Um, it's for obvious reasons, right? You don't want somebody turning on your webcam without your knowledge. It can be kind of weird. Um, so it's going to ask you to allow for uh, you know, hosted applications. There's ways to set it up so that basically it only asks that the first time, and then it kind of remembers after that. So I'm going to try to call Troy say, yep, i got to allow camera and microphone. And Wi-Fi guys be with us. We'll get a catch. Sure, are you sure you're connected? I can see my I'm not even getting that far. I got the stuff. And did you hear a lot? So I, uh, I will say very plainly, this happens just about every time I give a presentation. Um, <laughs> Wi-Fi has never been good at a single conference I've given this talk at, and uh, this is pretty commonplace when your Wi-Fi is, is not good. Oh, so so we there it is. So the other way around. <laughs> and now somebody else, I think, was trying to come in. Again, <laughs> I didn't build hooks in for this. Hopefully, if you guys are doing anything like this in a production environment, you're actually going to do more checks and hooks than I did. Um, I will say this stuff works a heck of a lot better than it might be showing right now, uh, but the Wi-Fi is kind of squatty, so take it for what it is. Um, to get this up and running, the, uh, the video example, there's a couple of things we have to do. One's called a call options, which is just basically a JS object we pass some constraints into. This is where you define whether you want access to video, audio, both, neither. Um, this could be something you might tie into a piece of UI that the user could actually click through and make changes to. Uh, and then we've got an on-local media and an on-connect handler. These guys are basically going to fire off when my webcam becomes available and when the other user's webcam becomes available. So basically when the stream is ready, that's when these are going to fire off. And in those methods, I'm just calling set video, uh, passing through an identifier for a div, and telling it, hey, here's your video stream. That's that event.element piece. Um, so what actually gets passed back to those is an event containing a, a video blob, which is a stream of video data from a webcam. And that's what you're actually attaching in your div that streams the video and audio. So here we're listening for a call event. That's what's going to fire off when somebody tries to call me. Makes sense. 
Uh, the call that we're working with, or the call object, is going to be event.call. And then here we're just doing a little check to say active call.caller equals, or excuse me, doesn't equal true. That means basically if I'm not the person who started this call, you're just doing a, a check to make sure you didn't initiate it, you're not trying to answer yourself. Um, then you do active call and answer and you pass through those options. So again, if I didn't want to allow access to my microphone, I can pass through a constraints object that had video on it. Right? Pass that back to the other user. And then I listen for the hang up event. So if the user wants to hang up, you just call uh, active call by hang up, and I'll get an event for that as well. So I'll know how to update my UI or do any other kinds of uh, fixes I might need to do after a call, clean up stuff. Um, and actually, to start that video call, we're going to go back to our trusty client.get endpoint. And once we have the endpoint, we're just going to say recipient endpoint.start video call and pass through those call options. So as the initiator, all you have to do to start that stream is to call this method start video call. Uh, from there, it's literally a matter of some divs on your page to attach the streams to, and you've got video calling working. Um, the rest of the stuff that you see here is really just some, some listener stuff to handle it, and some UI updates. So it's, it's a very limited amount of code required. Um, here's that set video map that I mentioned. You can see here it's just getting an element by the ID, which is the ID of the div that we want to attach to. Uh, the inner HTML gets cleared out just in case we had a previous call, and then we're appending video elements into that div. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on that? Pretty simple stuff. You mentioned that you can call in by phone. Can you call into a video chat? You can, I believe. Okay. I'm not 100 percent on that. Um, definitely follow up with me if you're uh, if you're interested in doing that. But the calling stuff is something that's not native to WebRTC. So the phone stuff is actually things that we built into our framework as a feature. Um, so you have the ability to say call you know six two one five four whatever and have it call in and talk to somebody in the browser. Um, you know, and there obviously wouldn't be video there, so it would probably be an audio-only call that you'd be working with. Um, since you don't have a way to transmit video between the phone, unless you're using mobile SDK and you're actually hooking, like, say, the, the camera on the phone. Actually, two questions. One is, how well does the peer-to-peer -peer detection of stuff work if you're on the same local network? Really well. Um, so the first thing it tries to do is actually connect you locally. So that, that whole ice stack, the first thing it's doing is saying, hey, do I, can I ping this person directly? From there it's going, okay, it's done. Uh, is it somebody that lives outside of the network? How do I connect to them? So if you're building like intranet applications, that uh, works very well. Okay. Um, and then I assume if, like, if you're both on a Wi-Fi connection that doesn't allow peer-to-peer -peer between connected things, it's still going to have to leave the network and come back? Yep, so in that, in that sense, it's almost like traditional, um, like a web socket almost, or a traditional okay. streaming technology. My second question is, how well, what, what kind of support on mobile is there for Very stuff? Very little uh, today, yeah. So we actually built out a mobile SDK ourselves to sort of uh, polyfill that issue for now, I guess, um, and to let you work with it on a native level. But as far as browser support on the mobile devices and tablets, it's not quite up to date yet. So you can build your own app that will connect to WebRTC, and that would be able to connect to JavaScript thing will connect or? to the hardware. So in our case, it's it's connecting to native hardware and being translated to operate in the same fashion as the framework for JavaScript. Uh, when it comes to actual WebRTC on the devices, it's the browser that supports WebRTC. So the actual you know source of the browser has to know about the WebRTC functionality. And if it doesn't exist there, you're not going to be able to run it. So in the case of a, a mobile browser, if it doesn't exist on that platform yet, there's not much you can do. So I guess more of my question is like, could you create a an app for you know, so not not even necessarily a a, a web page, but could you create a native app that would then be able to connect to another browser using WebRTC just by implementing the stuff natively? It would depend on how you set it up. I mean, because that's basically what we're doing for our framework uh, is to have the native code actually connect out and then you know connect into a WebRTC call. Um, it's just it's how you handle the backend basically that figures out how to connect all that stuff up. So as, as far as uh, you know, the, the simplicity of connecting browser to browser with WebRTC, it's not going to be the same with mobile to uh, native mobile to browser. Web mobile, once it's caught up, won't be the same. It'll just run one code base across all those platforms. Cool. So let's take a look at one more example, uh, which is screen sharing. This actually just got released a couple weeks ago. Um, Google Chrome and Firefox both have it now. Uh, they do require a bit of a plugin still to kind of. Again, fill in the gap until the updates to the browser are released. Um, but this allows you to treat your screen as an actual video source. So it streams it out just like we stream out webcam video, only uh, the data from your screen. So again, if I can get a little help from somebody in the audience, we'll cross our fingers on this one. Thanks, bro. 
All right, so you'll see here, this is the Google implementation of the UI. Uh, if anybody's used Google Hangouts for screen sharing, it's the same thing. I can actually choose to screen, share my whole screen, or let's just say I want to share only the uh, Sublime text. What this is actually going to do is just share it all to Troy. Um, I don't think I actually wrote the code to show it back on the screen, because I would be showing my screen within a screen, but uh, we'll see what happens here. Oh, it actually does, okay. So then you should be getting a feed of my screen, and if I go over to Sublime Text, you should be able to see updates of everything that's going on here. So it's a pretty slick implementation. Um, unfortunately, you don't have full control over desktop yet. Uh, it's a feature that I'm expecting to see in the future. Uh, control over mouse and keyboard, which would be really great for support scenarios. Uh, but to date, I mean, even just having access to this via JavaScript, no less, with no plugins is kind of amazing. That's how the, the, the Chromecast thing looks exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. Yep, same stuff, as far as I know. Um, I haven't looked at that specifically. I know what, uh, Google Hangouts uses the exact stuff with WebRTC. Um, and again, to do this, it's, it's going to look all very similar to what we did with our uh, video call. Um, there's an extra section here. I mentioned that plugin piece. Um, we just check basically if it needs the Chrome extension. And this is something that won't live on forever. It's just until they actually release the updates to the browsers that actually have this stuff in place. Um, but for now, you can do what's called an inline installation. So it basically checks and says, hey, does this user have my, uh, my plugin that I built? And if they don't, they can just uh, install it right there on the page. It'll just pop up automatically and say, hey, do you want to install this plugin? Use this feature? They say yes, it installs, and it actually reloads the page and, and runs everything. So you don't have to have them go off to a third party site or anything like that. Um, and the screen sharing piece itself, we're just getting access to that endpoint like we did previously. Um, and then we're going to call recipient.startScreenShare. And we're doing things a little bit differently here. Instead of using that uh, setup video method that I had previously, I'm actually passing through the actual elements that I want to connect the video stream to using this uh, video local element and video remote element properties. Um, and then the framework will actually take care of attaching the video uh, streams to those elements for you. So instead of having to do the you know, find div, attach, or append element, um, this takes care of that piece for you when they're all ready to go. Any questions on that? All right, so more information, uh, docs.respoke.io. If you guys want to try it out, again, you can sign up at respoke.io. So what's it all mean? Um, faster development. You know, using a framework like this is going to save you a lot of time. Uh, it's also taking out some of the headaches for things like uh, how to do browser checks. Uh, that's all stuff that's handled behind the scenes for you. Uh, better user experience. This is something I really want to drive home with people. We kind of have a lot of broken user experiences or uh, leftovers from previous days, right? If you think about going to your utility website or your cell phone or your energy bill or whatever. You have a question. You're already logged in on this website. They know who you are. They know your account information. Why is it then that you have to go dig around and find an 800 number, which you then have to call, and then punch in a bunch more information on the phone, and then tell them your account number, and finally, hopefully, get through to a human who asks you for that information all over again, and probably ends up handing up on you at some point. <coughs> we have these tools now, um, so I kind of see it as almost a responsibility to us as developers to create better experiences with this. We take that same scenario. Why not add a button to that same website that takes all the session information, packages it up as simple JSON, creates a connection with a support rep in the browser and sends it all across the pipe. So when that video call gets established and you're talking face to face with that other uh, support representative, they already know who you are. They know your account information. They know everything that you know. They even know the page you were looking at if you want to send that through. There's just, there's better experiences that we can create. And we can do better as developers. So I really want to challenge you guys to start thinking about these things a little bit more and how you might use these tools to you know, give your users uh, a better time. Happy bosses, all right, go out and build some cool products, save some revenue. Um, bosses, you know, being happy is always a great thing for everyone. Uh, but happy users is more important, right? So if you have a chance to connect people in meaningful ways, um, to expand communication, um, an application I saw just uh, a week ago was really an awesome idea. It connected non-native English speakers in Brazil, so kids that were trying to learn English, with elderly people in retirement homes in the US via WebRTC. So they'd go to the web page, they'd have a video call, and they'd sit and work on their English by talking to a lonely person in a retirement home. Right? I mean, that's a huge win-win. And they're not having to go out and host a server and pay for a bunch of bandwidth or pay for a bunch of technology. They just developed some JavaScript probably over a week and got this thing up and running. Um, so again, there's, there's chances for you to really do more meaningful things and you know, just kind of the silly chat examples that you see. But if that's your thing too, I mean, look at Slack, right? What did they just sell for? Anybody know? $700 million, something like that, right? Um, there's potential for this space. If people want to communicate in new ways and come up with a new Slack, come up with a new uh, Google Hangouts or HipChat or whatever else you know is coming up. That's the new one. Periscope and uh, uh, what's the old oh, Rodent? Meerkat. Meerkat's the other one. Yeah. 
so this live streaming thing is really big too. Um, so as this technology progresses and you add things like recording or the capability to just you know, stream it out live from a mobile device, um, think about that because there's, there's room in that space to play and the thing you create over the weekend might be the thing that really does make it big. Um, so one more thing I'd like to leave you with, communication should be a feature and not a product. Um, we look at communication as a thing you download, right? It's a cell phone you pick up, it's the Skype you open. Why do we always have to leave the context of the application we're working in or the website we're viewing in order to communicate with somebody? Why not instead build these things into the applications we're using? So just think about that and ponder that throughout the rest of the day. Uh, so that's it for me. Again, my name is Kyle Tayak. You guys can find me online at GeekGunNomad. That's uh, emails, ktayak at respoke.io. Uh, you can check out our framework at respoke.io. And all the examples and the source code for these are up on GitHub at the URL there at the bottom, which I'll leave up. Um, I've got some cards and some stickers if anybody wants one. I'm uh, happy to open it up to questions from here. On the pricing page, so those connect, you know, a lot number of concurrent connections. Mm -hmm. Are those only for the have they hit the turn server? So it's basically or usage of that, that server. So the, the um, turn server? Yeah, the way the pricing model works is basically as a developer you get five concurrent connections for free. So if five of us connected up to your app, you'd be full. If I then left, you'd have one more slot open. So concurrent is at any given But so connected though, I mean like to your application. Okay. So, so even that if means we're not actively really pushing really anything, you're just connected and that is five. Yep. Yep. So it's a connection basis. So if you needed 100 users in a you know a mid-sized office to be able to connect into your chat application uh, at any given time, that would be 100 connections planned. Uh, from there, it goes up you know 1,000, 10,000, whatever you need. Even if they're not using the turn server, they count as connections. Correct. Yeah. Anybody else? Sweet. Thanks, guys. Feel free to follow.